morning. So there's a big game on today, you say? I didn't realize that today. I didn't realize that. That's funny. I didn't know that it was today. She got one for Phil too. So as you were, if you were here two weeks ago, you found out it's on the bag. I'm a Seattle Seahawks fan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Most of you are like, hate me now. I want to walk out of this room. <laughs> um, here two weeks ago it was my birthday. Two weeks ago, and, and Pastor Phil was kind enough to like give me a birthday present. It was wrapped in blue and everything. It just happened to be a 49er shirt. <laughs> but uh, so you know, that was good. I was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, but I, you know, I've lived in California for 10 years. Um, I've come to the realization finally that Kevin Durant plays for some team called the Thunder, but not the, Se uh, not the Sonics. Um, see, only a few people got that, but that's okay. Um, so I've become a Kings fan over the years, and I love the San Jose Sharks. About a day to Oh yeah, Dennis, yeah. Sharks, everybody, you're, you're my best friends right now. The Sharks. We will go to games together. Um, <clears throat> But I, I uh, since I was a little kid, I've, I've been a Seahawks fan, so I'm pretty excited about today. In fact, when we ever do get Seahawks games um, on the TV, and I actually have a free Sunday afternoon, my, my kids have just become diehard Seahawks fans. They've been cheering. In fact, two weeks ago before the game, um, my, uh, my oldest, Karis, she said, I think we should move to Seattle. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's great, but so. Two weeks ago, we, we rooted on the Seahawks, we were cheering for them, and, and Karis was so excited. She said, there's this thing called the Super Bowl. I was like, is the Super Bowl tomorrow? I said, no, Karis, this is going to be the longest, most agonizing two weeks in your life. Um, we have to wait two weeks till the Super Bowl. And she looks at me and she says, you know, I'm really excited for the Super Bowl, but I'm not sure who I'm going to root for, Seattle or Denver. <laughs> follow with you. I said, go to your room right now. <laughs> Just kidding. I didn't say that. But I asked her, who cares? Why? Why Denver? She's like, well, I've been to Denver before. When have you been to Denver? <laughs> She's like, remember we stayed a night in a hotel in Denver? And all of a sudden it clicked on me, to me. And I said, you mean that night when our flight got canceled, when I had four kids and all of your luggage, that we had to go all the way across that darn airport out to the little plus thing that bumped all the way down 45 minutes to some random hotel just for me to sleep for three hours with no extra diapers, no clean clothes, only to get back at 6 o'clock in the morning to get on a flight that night in Denver? Uh-huh. That's the worst day of my life. But uh, just the other day she told me she wanted to uh, change her Little Mermaid room to a Seahawks room. <laughs> and uh, she, uh, she did her first sewing project in I Love Seahawks Banner, so my parenting skills have been successful. <laughs> and the heart that was once divided has been made whole. <laughs> you know, I, I joke around, but the truth is, the only thing that I want for my daughters and for my son is to have a whole heart after God. I had the privilege um, of sitting with, with Karis, my oldest, she's in second grade. During the second service, they were here. She sat through the service. So we went through communion. I got to sit there and just tell her about the truth of God. And pray with her. And I got to hear her sing on the top of her lungs, You are stronger, you are stronger. There's nothing I want more than to have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, a whole heart of relationship with Jesus Christ. And I, I really wanted to show a video this morning, something that the Seahawks put together called Jesus is Better Than the Super Bowl. But I realize there's still some hurt feelings out there, so I decided against it. But Jesus is better than Super Bowl. Pastor Bill mentioned it, Pastor Darren mentioned it. Jesus is everything. Jesus holds everything together with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand. He leads us, and we've seen him lead the people of Israel and be faithful and kind and, and gentle. But over these past few weeks, we've seen the nation of Israel and God's people. Altar. We've seen the divided nation, we've seen their divided hearts, they've forgotten God, they've worshipped other things, and honestly it's been rather depressing. And today isn't really going to change. The 
We've had somebody in the first service who said, I've been a Christian for 55 years, and I've never heard a sermon on what you preached this morning. So you're in for a treat. <laughs> um, as we've been going through the Bible, we saw one of the biggest things that God did in the Old Testament was to use this old couple, Abraham and Sarah. So even in your old age, you're going to have a son. And I promise that I'm going to make a numerous nation of people out of this. And they laughed at God. But God was faithful to his promises, and this brand new nation started. A brand new nation that was for God for a distinct purpose of accomplishing his plan of providing a way back to the relationship that we had with God in the Garden of Eden. God enacted a plan for the Messiah to come so that we can remember Him. The part of this plan was to give the law uh, to Moses to instruct the nation of Israel how this relationship would work, how life with God would work, and to allow the surrounding nations to see the character of God through His people. But Israel doesn't even come close to holding up their end of the bargain. God continues to save, continues to instruct, continues to provide, and Israel we've seen continues to look the other way. For hundreds of years they forget God, and God has patiently waited, He's patiently instructed, He's patiently warned and given chance and chance again, but they would not, could not, did not listen. So I truly believe that God would be justified in totally scrapping the whole plan, starting over with a new group of people, but He made a promise, an unconditional promise to Abraham and to David that He would use their descendants to bring Messiah into the world. So there's this promise that's made. But the holiness of God can't stand the sin that the people continue to commit. So this last week, in the weeks previous, we've seen this kingdom divided. And remember last week we had uh, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom that was divided in this black line right here. This is roughly where the division between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Last week we saw that the northern kingdom of Israel and the sins of King Ahab, that they were exiled into the area of Assyria. And they were taken away from the land and the land was destroyed. But God has left Judah for a time period. Because within Judah you see just south of this border, within the southern kingdom of Judah is Jerusalem, is God's holy city, the city of David. God remembers his people, and there's nothing more that he longs for than them to return. For them to remember God, for them to change their ways, to return to that relationship with him. And so today we're going to look at the southern kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah, and how God uh, speaks to them, and, and how God uh, interacts with the kings of Judah. So let's take a look at Judah's kings. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 21. You have the story, it's page 231, 232, 2 Kings chapter 21. We're going to see, take a look at the last kings of Judah. Well, one was good, most were bad, but we're going to look at Manasseh, who was really, really, really bad. Verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 21. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 55 years. Verse 2, he said, Did I evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites? He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. It was important to know, as Ahab, king of Israel, the northern kingdom, the kingdom that's already exiled, the same sins that he committed that caused uh, this, this exile to Assyria, Manasseh is doing the same things. And he bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord. For which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced divination, sought omens, consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. And I love the author here in Kings. He goes even further. See, do you get this? He took the carved Asherah pole he had made and he put it in the temple. This is the king of the holy city, Jerusalem. This is the king of Judah, God's promised land, his people. And he makes 
of God out of wood and puts it into the holy temple of God. The temple of which David is son Saul, and God said in this temple in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, so I'll put my name forever. I will not again make the feet of the Israelites wander from the land I gave their ancestors, if only they will be careful to do everything I command them, and will keep the whole law that my servant Moses gave them. But the people did not listen, and Manasseh led them astray. So that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. You catch that? God led his people to this promised land. And they've gotten to a point where God, he's saying, you are worse than all the nations around you. Combined, you're doing more atrocities. And God can't stand to see his holy temple, his holy city, and even more, his people being led astray by this king. Now one of the important parts of the story during this period of, of Judah's history is that God uh, spoke to his people through prophets to warn the kings, to warn the remnant of Judah, to let them know that God's um, wrath, and, and what I mean by God's wrath is it's just his response to his holiness. God can't be a part of sin. He is holy. So these prophets come, as voices of God just say, turn and repent. God can't be a part of this. And they come and they, they offer up a, a warning and they offer up a chance to repent, to return to God. And this, this time period in the history of Judah was primarily Jeremiah, who's known as the weeping prophet, and Ezekiel. And these two prophets come and they, they give warnings to the people. Because God's reputation is on the line. God's name, His character, His holiness is being blasphemed by this king. And he's leading God's people to do the same. So I wanted just to set that up because in verse 10 here, we're going to keep going in verse 10, it says, The Lord said through His servants the prophets, and His prophets came and spoke. And they say to Manasseh, king of Judah, Verse 11, so Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him and has led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. I will stretch out over Jerusalem the measuring line used against Samaria and the plumb line used against the house of Ahab. I will wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. Can you understand why she had to this sermon on this in 55 years? These are hard words to hear. It's difficult for us to reconcile this, this wrath of God, this holiness, and how we can't stand sin. But He's holy, He's set apart. And he can't endure it any longer. And he has a plan. A plan to make a way. Going down uh, to, to verse 16. Moreover, Manasseh also said, shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. Besides the sin that he had caused Judah to commit. So that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> I love verse 17. As for the other events of Manasseh's reign and all he did, including the sins he committed... Are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Aren't you glad there's no history books that are going to record your sins for people to read down the line? But this is Manasseh. He was just against God. God couldn't stand it any longer. But he still waits, and there's this line of kings, the kings of Judah, and you have them in the back, you have them listed in your sheet. There was Ammon, his son, who succeeded him, who was just as bad as his father. And there's one king, Josiah, who was good, who found the book of the law, who read it to the people, and they, they repented and they returned to God, but that wouldn't last long. Then there was Jehoaz, who was bad, Jehoiakim, who was bad, Jehoiakim, bad, Zedekiah, really, really bad. And those were the kings of Judah. Out of six kings, the last six kings of Judah, only Josiah, who began his reign when he was only eight years old. God was the most eight minutes, so scary. <laughs> he was eight years old, remembered God, and led Judah well. 
But in this time period, 111 years from Manasseh to Zedekiah, from 697 to 586 B.C., they continued to rebel against God. And it wasn't necessarily even a rebellion. It was just this complete lack of disregard for who God was. And we see this. We're going to turn over to one of these prophets, Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 21. We're going to see the prophet Jeremiah. Our hearing the story, page 242. And there's Jeremiah 21, verses 1 through 10. In a section I like to call, Oh, sure, now you remember. So there's been a hundred years, right? This wild disobedience, this, this ignoring that God has existed or had any part in their lives. We read 20, chapter 21, verse 1 of Jeremiah. So the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah, so this was the last king in Judah, he said to him, Pastor, son of Malkajah, the priest Zephaniah, son of Masiah, you know, I, I found if you just say those words like you're confident that you know what they are, then it's fine. Don't quote me if those are the right pronunciations. And they come to him, not the king, but these two delegates come to, to Jeremiah, and they say to him, Inquire now of the Lord for us, because Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is attacking us. And perhaps the Lord will perform wonders for us as in times past, so that he will withdraw from us. What? It's been a hundred years! And even more than that, it's been 17 years that Nebuchadnezzar and, and the kingdom of Babylon has been coming and taking uh, people from Judah into exile. But now they're into the holy city of Jerusalem. Now they're really on Zedekiah's doorsteps. And he finally says, okay, well, we need to do something here. So they go to Jeremiah, say, hey, you know God, right? We've heard he's performed miracles before, that he's done great things for his people. Do you think he'd do that again? This is a total lack of disregard of God and His holiness. Because God comes to us again and again to His people and say, if you would humble yourselves, if you would repent, if you would turn from your, your wicked ways, if you would come and remember me in my holiness and set you apart, you aside, then I'll come. But they just come to Jeremiah and say, hey, your God, He saved people before, He'll probably do it again, right? There's no repentance. There's no regard for the holiness of God and who He is. It's just a time of trouble and they want God to act. And so Jeremiah's words to back to Zedekiah, verse 3, verse 4, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you. And I'll gather them inside this city. And I myself am going to fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm and furious anger and great wrath from Phil. Because of what you've done, I can't stand it. I can't handle it. It goes on. Verse 7, he said, There's the Lord, I'll give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his officials and the people in the city who survived the plague, sword, and famine into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to their enemies who want to kill them, and he will put them to sword, and he will show them no mercy or pity. It's harsh to hear, but in it we understand just a glimpse of the holiness of God. And maybe in it, as we think about our own sin, as we think about our own lives, and we think about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us, we get a greater understanding of why Jesus had to go to such great pain for us. Because God's holiness is so immense. But He's also faithful in completeness as well, and it's this hard thing to rationalize. But it's this truth of God. And what we're going to see in verses 8 through 10 that He leads the way. Because the express purpose of God and His relationship with Israel is always to demonstrate that He is the one true God who wants His people to come back into that first relationship with Him. It's what He desires, it's what He calls for us. And so we see verse 8 through 10, He makes a way. It says, furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says. So he's speaking to the people of Judah, not to Zedekiah the king right now, but say to the people, See, I am setting before you the way of life 
and the way of death. But there is a way of life. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. They will escape with their lives. For I have determined to do the city harm and not good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will destroy it with fire. It will be cleansed. It will be purged. We often say that term, refiner's fire. My heart's desire is to sing that song. There's a sense of this cleansing fire that God needs to cleanse the impurities, that the atrocities that have happened in this holy city, Jerusalem, and in Judah, and in Israel, to his people. Just like he needs to clean the atrocities in our life. And then he has, and he did. But he uses this unexpected king to administer this justice, to administer this, this cleanse, this foreign king. And in this God is trying to restore again that relationship, which we know is ultimately only going to be made possible through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But he's making a way, he's setting a way, he's allowing them a place to go, a place to remain, to continue that relationship with him as his people. Because if he lets Judah remain in its rebellion, it's going to send a confusing message to the surrounding nations about who he is and what his holiness is like. So God must discipline them, and he uses the Babylonians to do just that. So as I said, this, this exile to Babylon was over a period of, of 17 years. And these prophets I've been talking about, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, Ezekiel was actually one of the first prophets to be taken into exile. So towards the very beginning, and the beginning of those 17 years, Ezekiel is taken to Babylon. And he primarily becomes God's voice to the people already in exile, to the people in Babylon. And while he's there, he continues to try to tell the people, this is what the Lord God is doing. He's cleansing, and Jerusalem is going to be purged. It's going to be cleansed, and we need to repent. And his message wasn't popular, but he was the voice to the people already in exile. And then there was Jeremiah, who was in Jerusalem until the end. He saw the complete destruction, the loss of, of Judah, the loss of Jerusalem. And we have his lament in the book of Lamentations. That's why he's known as the weeping prophet. And in that, we, we get to have a glimpse of truly how God felt. He didn't want His holy city to be destroyed. But it had to happen because of His holiness. He didn't want His Son to die. But it had to happen for the sake of our holiness and our relationship with Him. Jeremiah is this weeping prophet. And God, we hear His weeping voice, the lament of Jerusalem that has fallen, and Judah that has fallen. I want to go back to Jeremiah chapter 2. So you reverse the chapter 21, go back to chapter 2. If you're in the story, you go back to pages 238 and 239. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 13 and then 26 through 28. And we see this warning to Judah that comes uh, from, from Jeremiah as he's there with the people. He says this in verse 13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. They've forsaken me, the one who's given them everything. And two, they've dug their own cisterns. They forgot about my living water, so they've dug their own cisterns. And God he goes on to say, broken cisterns that can't hold water. It's a life that's not worth living. It's a life that's going to be fruitless. That's not going to be beneficial to anybody. Because they've forsaken me. I love 26 through 28 of chapter uh, um, just 2 there. It says, As a thief is disgraced when he is caught, so the people of Israel are disgraced. They, their kings, and their officials, their priests, and their prophets, they say to wood, You are my father, and to stone, You gave me birth. They have turned their backs to me and not their faces, and yet when they are in trouble, they come. They say, come and save us. So then, where are your gods you made for yourselves? Where is your wood? Where is your stone? Let them come if they can save you when you are in trouble. For you, Judah, have as many gods as you have talents. 
God specifically said, I am the Lord your God. I am one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. They have more gods than they have towns. And I don't think it's too horribly dissimilar from us today. God, who can't stand this. Judah has fallen, and eventually God even allows his holy city, even his temple, to be destroyed and to fall to the hands of Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar. We see in 2 Kings chapter 25, you don't have to turn there, but we see this exactly what was prophesied. The Babylon army comes into, going within the walls, into the city of Jerusalem. They kill Zedekiah and his sons. They come and they set fire to the temple of the Lord, to the royal palace and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building is burned down. And the whole Babylonian army under the commander of the Imperial Guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. The whole city is demolished. Walls, buildings, and everything. It is completely purged. In verse 11 in 2 Kings 25, it says that the commander of the guard army is an interesting passage here. That he carried into exile the people who remained in the city, along with the rest of the populace and those who had deserted to the king of Babylon. And in this we just start to see this glimpse of, of God and his, and his faithfulness to his people and his desire to want them to be saved, his desire to, to want to discipline them and want to return to his holiness, but we see this gentleness in some strange way. Because he said, I'm making a way of life for you. You can leave, you can surrender to the Babylons. And we see that. That there was a people who had been outside of the city, who had already uh, deserted and came out with Babylon. We see that. But then we also see the people who were in the city still, not Zedekiah, Zedekiah's dead. He's gone. But the people in the city get taken. And they go to a place where we're going to see in the coming chapters ahead, when the story is going to go on, that God makes his name pretty great in the kingdom of Babylon, too. And he has this plan for hope. In fact, Jeremiah 29, 11, I don't know why I didn't think about this in the other services, but it's the famous verse, I know the plans I have for you in place of the Lord. Plans to prosper, plans for hope. And we're going to see too in Ezekiel that his message, once they hear the news that the holy city of Jerusalem is flattened, has completely fallen. Remember, that he's been over there for 17 years. They hear this news, his message that has been all doom and gloom, declaring God's judgment, is now going to also turn to this message of hope. Everything is gone. Everything is destroyed. But God speaks to his people and said, here's the hope. I've not forsaken you. I've not left you. We see this. If you want to turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, it's right after Jeremiah. Chapter 36, we're going to look at chapter 37 as well. God scums. We see right in verse 33 of chapter 36. This is what the sovereign Lord says. So this is the word from God coming to his people through Ezekiel. It says, On the day. I cleanse you from all your sin. I will resettle your towns, and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say this land that was laid waste has become like the garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Once again, I will yield to Israel's plea and do this for them. I will make their people as numerous as sheep, as numerous as the flocks for offerings in Jerusalem during her appointed festivals. So will the ruined cities be filled with flocks of people. They will know that I am the Lord. There's this plan for hope. There's a plan for prosper. God said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm also not going to leave my land. It needs to be purged now. It needs to be made whole. But I have plans. And in chapter 37, perhaps one of the most well-known or famous, if you will, passages in Ezekiel, the Valley of Dry Bones. And we all know the song, Dem Bones and Bones and Dry Bones. This is the passage 
God gives Ezekiel a vision of this valley of dry bones. And as I read this in chapter 37, so I want you to listen and let these words perhaps speak to your dry bones in your life right now. So the hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and Flesh appeared down them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Come breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, and fast. And he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. The people of Israel, they, they declare that our, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land, and you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Remember that the express purpose of God in his relationship with Israel, in his relationship with us, is to demonstrate that he is the one true God, and he wants people to come back into relationship. So even in this dry valley, even in captivity, even in a place where they don't want to be, God saying, I will breathe life into you again. And I believe he does, I know he does the same for us. Our bones may feel dry. We may feel empty. But God, in his holiness and his grace, breathes life into us. In a lot of ways, this is a hard story to hear. In the lower story, we have this desolation, we have this foreign king destroying a nation, flattening the temple, taking all these people away from their home. But in this upper story, in God's upper story, God is declaring his holiness. In the upper story, we see this picture of not the earthly king who comes to purge, but of the heavenly king, of King Jesus who comes to purge holy of our sin, of our for our souls to cleanse us, to make us right with Him, to renew that relationship once again. Because we know in Romans 6.23, for the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We deserve the same fate as Zedekiah. We deserve death, but God in His plan is making a way because he knows that we are dead because of our sin. He gives us this possibility in Romans 10, 9 that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You are not conquered. You are not defeated. You dry bones. They live. Because of Christ's sacrifice. Jesus offers himself for us. You know, I truly believe that as Jesus was up there on the cross, of all the pain of being nailed to the cross, of the pain of the, the whipping and the scourging and the crown of thrones, I think there was nothing that hurt Jesus as much 
as when the Father turned his face away. Because God in his holiness, when he took the sins of mankind upon himself, God could have nothing to do with him. Because God in his holiness could have nothing to do with sin. And so he was willing to satisfy his wrath, to satisfy his holiness, to offer up his sons so that the covering of his blood would make us holy if we would believe and confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And we know that to be true. And so again, in this story, he demonstrates that he is the one true God. And in everything, he wants us to come back into a holy relationship. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the price that was paid for our sin. God, we may not ever be able to reconcile this understanding of your wrath and your holiness, but God, we thank you so much of helping us understand what depravity of sin we were in, of what we truly deserve, but you, Christ alone, made a way. You are our hope, and you are our strength. So as we come to worship and sing to you, God, we give you more. We put our hope and our trust.